Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Paris Schutz. Brandis Friedman has the night off. On the show tonight, community leaders respond to yet another violent weekend in Chicago. The city's public health commissioner on Chicago's reopening and travel quarantine. A local children's book is back in the spotlight. What parts of Chicago have hidden flood risks? And a naming contest for the city's piping plover chicks. First tonight, some of what's happening here in Chicago tonight. Yet another violent holiday weekend in Chicago. From 6 p.m. Thursday through midnight Sunday, the Chicago Police Department reports 87 people were shot, 17 of them fatally. In a news conference today, Police Superintendent David Brown focused in particular on the deaths of two children on Saturday, 7-year-old Natalia Wallace as she played outside her grandmother's home in South Austin, and 14-year-old Varnado Jones who was shot in the back in Englewood when gunmen allegedly started shooting into a crowd. We cannot allow this to be normalized in this city. We cannot get used to hearing about children being gunned down in Chicago every weekend. And police announced late this afternoon that 33-year-old Reginald Merrill has been charged with first-degree murder in connection with Wallace's death. Carol Marine and her guests will have more on Chicago's persistent violence problem in just a few minutes. Meanwhile, public health officials report six more Illinois residents have died from COVID-19 in the past 24 hours. That number matches the six deaths reported on Sunday, which was the lowest number of coronavirus-related deaths recorded in a single day here since late March. The total number of COVID-19 deaths in the state now stands at 7,026. Another 614 new cases of the virus were confirmed since yesterday, and the state has now recorded almost 148,000 people having contracted the virus since the pandemic began. And we'll have more on the city's quarantine travel order later in the program. And good news for Chicago residents struggling to pay their utility bills. Mayor Lori Lightfoot is announcing a new program to reduce water and sewer bills for the city's most economically vulnerable residents. Once you enroll in this program, your water and sewer bills will be cut by 50%. Not only will you get relief on payments moving forward, you'll also have the opportunity to have your debt forgiven. And at the same news conference, Lightfoot quashed any hopes that Chicago's beaches will reopen in the near future, despite the recent scorching temperatures. We don't see the beaches opening up anytime soon. The challenge with the beaches is that, and, and with swimming pools, let's just add that in, is that um, they are rife for um, congregate gathering and not social distancing. The city does have a number of cooling centers to help Chicagoans beat the heat. And now we go to Carol Marine and a look at this summer's persistent violence. Carol. Paris, thank you. A seven-year-old girl in Austin, a 14-year-old boy in Englewood. Two of the children gunned down in Chicago this weekend, the latest in a horrific month of kids being shot and killed across the city. Since June 20th, nine children have perished through gun violence in Chicago, and the city's police department says 87 people overall were shot during the 4th of July weekend. So here we are, another Monday, another violent summer weekend in the city. Where do we go from here? Joining us are Pam Bosley, co-founder of Purpose Over Pain, a group that works with parents who have lost children to gun violence, and which advocates for gun reform legislation. Her son Terrell was shot and killed in 2006. State Representative LaShawn Ford, whose district includes much of Chicago's Austin neighborhood, and Reverend Anthony Williams, pastor at the Avalon Park United Church of Christ on Chicago's South Side, he lost his son, Nehemiah, to gun violence in 2018 and now supports a bill in Springfield that would recognize violence as a public health crisis. Welcome all of you to Chicago tonight. Let me begin, if I may, with what police superintendent David Brown said today, pointing a finger at where he thinks a solution might lie. Here is what he said. We will leverage every resource at our disposal to not just catch these killers, 
but to also prevent it from happening ever again. For this to happen, we must keep vile offenders in jail longer in this city. And we must revamp the electronic monitoring program. Representative Ford, the public officials ultimately responsible for trying to keep people in jail longer are state's attorney Kim Fox and Cook County Chief Judge Tim Evans. Is this on their doorstep? Well, Carol, I would say that if we know that it's the violent offenders that are let out on house arrest, then we could go straight to them. I don't know how he connects the um, actual offenders to those that have been let out on um, house arrest and bond when the um, clearance rate is less than 10%. So I don't know if that's the problem. I think that we have to make sure that we deal with this as a public health crisis and do everything that we can to stop the floor of guns in the neighborhoods. Ms. Bosley, what do you think about that? I, I say that because uh, I know this past weekend they deployed over 1,200 police officers into the community, and you see what happened, nothing. I'm, I'm sta I believe that the police department, we need to defund the police department and reallocate the funds into communities of, uh, that's on the grounds working, into the mental health department, um, violence preventive programs, because the police show up after the fact. And we've been practicing this over years after years. You, you follow the years... Um, this happened every year. We talk about the same thing. They do the same thing over the um, holiday weekend, and we still wake up without our children. So I'm, I'm, uh, I think that I believe that defund the police department. Let's try something new and put money on the ground. Reverend Williams, what's your take on what the superintendent said today about what the problem is? We have a solution that can help this uh, superintendent and all citizens of the state of Illinois. HRO 433, it, uh, violence as a health crisis. La in last year's session, all 118 lawmakers passed this resolution. We must make it a binding document. We are now dealing with the pandemics of violence. Violence is the disease, it's not a contagion, but it's a major health crisis. We have a solution. And I'm praying and I'm hoping that the lawmakers will have special session and pass HRO 433. We need solutions right now. We have a lot of conversations, but this particular legislation will bring about a major uh, solution in dealing with the pandemic effects of violence in the state of Illinois and the state of Chicago. We need that bill passed. Let me come back to that in just a second, Reverend. Ms. Bosley, police have long argued that part of the problem is that the community and victims' families don't cooperate with them. You have had the tortured experience of the loss of your own child. What's your take on that? You know what? Um, the police department, when, when a black person is killed in the city of Chicago, the first thing they do is look at the character of the child. Like even with Terrell, uh, one newspaper article put out that Terrell was in a gang and he was a college student doing all the right things. So um, that they, they, instead of pulling the cameras and find out who murdered our children, they don't do that. So that's why we have over 80% of the cases unsolved. And um, it's, I think that it, it's just an excuse. It's an excuse. It, I don't know if you listened to the mom this past weekend, Siri's mom. She talked about how they they came out talking about what the family did wrong, uh, the, the young man. You know, they was trying to blame the family instead of solving Sincere's, the youngest baby uh, case. So that's why these cases remain unsolved. Reverend Williams, your son Nehemiah's killer or killers, were they caught and if so was it with the help of witnesses or community never never caught and was the community helpful in with the police or not uh i i didn't even i didn't even bother to get in at all I, all god my family my community and our church understood we would have to turn his tragic death into a victory for all that's why we need legislation passed in america you move the needle by way of the law. We would still be on the back of the bus without legislation. And the only way to deal with this Leviathan is to pass HR 0433. I assure all of you, everyone in this city and state will feel safe if this particular legislation is turned into law. So Prisker and all the lawmakers need to have a special session and let's pass uh, this violence and health crisis or the disease, but not a contagion. That's what we need right now. 
Representative Ford, exactly what good would it do to declare a public health crisis via this legislation? I mean, what comes with it that really has some teeth? Well, we could deal with this as it is. It's a public health crisis, Carol. When you think about it, when you have two people that's in a conflict, there are certain people with a behavioral health problem or mental health problems that handle the conflict differently. If the group of us are in a conflict right now, we're not going to pick up a gun and kill each other over a conflict. We're going to do everything that we can to figure it out and make it work. When you have people that pick up guns and could just take the life of someone, we know it's a public health crisis. And the only thing that we want to do in this state and in this city is to deal with it by policing. It's not going to work. It's never worked. We have to make sure that on the scene that we go to families that have had a loved one murdered and immediately intervene with behavioral health and support them with mental health um, support. It works. That's what it called when we talk about de-escalation. That's what happens when what you have. So oh, what, yeah. what will it cost? I mean, let's put some uh, meat on the bones of this um, for all of you. What what kind of money? What needs to come with that legislation for it to be meaningful? Edu edu education, collaboration, civility, and redirect the funding. Uh, we it's time to stop playing with this issue intelligently we can deal with this issue it is a solution it is a game changer it, it will educate it will bring forth collaboration we need to look at institutional violence also civility violence ain't cool don't kill me because i bumped into your car and redirect the funding you have people receiving funding with no measurable you cannot solve violence walking people down an expressway Ms. Yeah. Bosley, Ms. Bosley do you agree with mm -hmm. that um I, I believe that I know that um, that this violence, you know, we sh we should treat it as a public a public health issue, just like we did COVID nineteen. Um, it is a public health issue. So if we invest the same funding into it, just like we did the, um, you know, when everybody came together, representatives they voted for funds to go into the communities for the COVID nineteen. We should do the same thing for violence. But uh, two, I want to say that um, in order for this to to you know, to change and we need to, we need to define, I'm sticking with defunding the police department too. So it's still redirecting funds into areas that need to be put into. Pam and Bosley, Pam Bosley, Representative LaShawn Ford, Reverend Anthony Williams, <laughs> thank you very much for talking to us. I think we're going to continue this conversation across many weeks. Many thanks to all of you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Up next, Chicago's top public health official on the city's reopening, but first, a look at the weather. New coronavirus cases are exploding in many parts of the country, with record numbers being set daily in states like Arizona, Texas, and Florida. Meanwhile, Chicago and Illinois are in phase four of reopening, bolstered by data showing a continued decrease in deaths here. Today, the Lightfoot administration's 14-day quarantine for any traveler coming from one of 15 designated states with high COVID rates went into effect. It's a policy announced right before the holiday weekend, but can that keep the region safe? Joining us is Dr. Allison Arwadi, Chicago's Department of Public Health Commissioner. Dr. Arwadi, thank you so much for being back here. Thanks for having me. All right, so explain this 14-day quarantine rule which went into effect today. Sure. So we've made such good progress here in Chicago and in Illinois broadly that we felt like it was important that we do everything we can to protect that progress. And so similar to some other states and jurisdictions, we've put in place a mandatory quarantine order for anyone who is returning from these 15 states where really the outbreak is out of control. We don't say you can't travel there, but if you travel there, when you come back, you basically need to take a time out. You need to stay home for 14 days uh, before you can go out and be back in public with some exceptions for essential and, and the mayor commuted or announced plans for communicating that new rule uh, let's hear what she had to say we've now got a full um, communications marketing plan in place at our airports we're working on the trains um, we're going to be 
doing signage um, on our highways. This is about educating people into compliance. All right, so a lot of communications, marketing, educating. Will there be punitive measures enforced? So yes, we have the ability to fine people if we learn that they are not complying with this order um, between $100 and $500 per day. So that would be a maximum of $7,000 over the 14 days. Our goal primarily would be to use that if we were to find in the course of doing an investigation uh, that someone had not taken this order seriously. And as the mayor said, our main goal is to really educate people um, into compliance as we've done so for so many of our orders. My very first public health order was the one saying you must stay home in the city of Chicago if you're even a little bit sick. Like that one, you know, we're not having people call the police on their neighbors, but we're making sure by using an order that people really take it seriously. It's not the time to be vacationing to these states. It's not the time to be having non-essential business travel to these states. I think in some countries, I mean, they, they track people, they follow up with them on the phone. You're not saying the city of Chicago is going to engage in those kinds of efforts. That's not our plan at the moment. Our plan is to really work on making sure people know about it. So even we've been working with the airlines that if people are booking tickets to Chicago, they're getting that information about the quarantine requirement before they book that ticket, uh, having hotels, Airbnbs, et cetera, share that same information. And as states are able to get their outbreaks under control, they would then come off the list. We update it every single week. So the goal is not to entirely stop travel. The goal is to really put that quarantine in place and try to do what we can as a city City to protect the really good progress that we've made here in Chicago. And I, I'm curious, why did the city of Chicago feel the need to do this before uh, the state of Illinois announced any kind of measures to this um, effect? Yeah. So certainly we've been having this conversation um, with Illinois. Obviously, our, our two main airports are here in the city of Chicago. And where we think about a lot of um, travelers from outside of Illinois coming in, Chicago is a main destination for them. And so in a lot of ways, the impact of travel likely to be felt more strongly, particularly for these states that are further afield here in Chicago than potentially in the rest of Illinois. We continue to have conversations you know, with the governor's office, but at the moment, it is a city of Chicago requirement. All right, so we're, we're in favor phase four now of the reopen in Chicago and Illinois, a little over two weeks into it. Has it been successful uh, from a public health perspective? Um, yes, generally we've been pleased. The most important thing that predicts whether we continue on the good trajectory that we've been on are the individual decisions that people make. Wearing the masks, keeping the six foot distance, helping protect people who are at higher risk of serious outcomes from COVID. And broadly speaking, we were able to do that reopening because we were on this good downward trajectory, particularly over the month of June. We expect to see some flattening of that as we've seen. Won't be surprised to see some slight increases as there are more opportunities for COVID to spread. But as long as we can keep it in control as a city, as a region, as a state, uh, we'll, be, we'll be satisfied. And that's, again, the decisions people are making every day. And to that effect, the city did shut down a party boat this weekend and find five business. I think we've all seen the images across the country of packed holiday parties. How has Chicago done in terms of maintaining social distance, companies complying, people uh, not gathering in, in packed parties. I think broadly, we've done quite a good job here in Chicago. I think we've mostly managed to see us as Chicagoans against the virus, as opposed to making something like wearing a face covering or doing social distancing some sort of partisan or political uh, issue. So I think that's been a plus for us. And when I talk to people in some of the surrounding states, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, they actually say they can tell when folks from Chicago are in town because they're the ones wearing masks. And I want Chicago to continue to be known for that. We've certainly been working a lot on messages and enforcement um, for potential areas that can be of concern. Um, and I think broadly that's been going quite well. The great majority of our businesses understand that we're playing the long game here. If we can keep things in control, if we abide by the restrictions that are in place now, it sets us up to really be in a place where we're able to hopefully eventually further reopen or even be able to bring in regional tourism in a way that is safer. Well, when you see the exploding cases across the country, are you worried that that will eventually spill over into Illinois? 
Yeah, of course I'm worried. I think anybody in the U.S. needs to be worried about COVID and seeing what's happening. Any problem across the U.S., right, is a problem for anybody who lives in the U.S. We, even where we have quarantine um, restrictions in place, we know that we continue to just have a lot of movement in general. And by and large, it just suggests that there are real problems still in the way that we are treating COVID-19. You know, that, that limit that we set for the states that are under quarantine, that's where we were here in Chicago and Illinois back when we were under a stay-at-home order, but none of these states are actually under stay-at-home orders. And so I'm really concerned that we are a very long way as a country from being done with COVID, and that means, of course, that we are a long way from being done with it here. Again, we mostly, you know, we can control what we can control, and that means doing everything we can uh, to keep our numbers where they are, not see those big increases here. In and what would you need to see um, to uh, make you decide, all right, you know, we need to stop with the indoor dining for now. Yeah, so every single day we look in detail at all of our data. We have a call with the mayor every morning and we look at any potential hotspots. So for one thing, if we're seeing increases in positivity or increases in cases, even at a zip code level, we're very quickly diving into that data to understand was there a cluster of some kind? Is there some sort of intervention that's needed? We're obviously doing follow-up on cases and looking for any um, exposures that are consistent across those. And we're just looking at our trends overall. We've said pretty clearly that as long as we continue to see things be relatively flat, we're sort of in an okay place, uh, we'd need to get back onto a downward trajectory to be able to be thinking about moving ahead further with reopening. And if we started to see serious problems with the increases in cases, or particularly in uh, anything that was threatening the healthcare system, we would move quickly if we needed to, to take steps backwards. We're at record lows here right now for both hospitalizations and deaths, uh, and we really want to keep it that way. All right. Dr. Allison Arwadi, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And still to come on Chicago tonight, taking a look at new maps of Chicago's flood zones. The local museum that grew out of a protest movement in the 1970s. A fresh look at a popular children's book made right here in Chicago. The story behind a family film archive that offers a glimpse of Chicago's boom years. Endangered piping plovers return to Chicago to expand their family. And in viewer feedback, your thoughts about the move by some colleges to drop standardized testing. But first, Illinois is about a week into its new fiscal year, and we've got new numbers on how the state fared in the fiscal year that closed out in June. Amanda Vinicky joins us now with a fresh look at the impact of the coronavirus on state finances. Amanda, I imagine it's not very pretty. Yeah, well, Paris, you know, as soon as COVID-19 was classified as a pandemic, it was obvious that it was going to be brutal for some individuals and some businesses, finances, and therefore on their governments. And we are beginning to get a better glimpse of what that looks like for Illinois. And that's thanks in part to an analysis out from the state's nonpartisan fiscal forecasting arm. We'll get an overview from Revenue Manager Jim Mushinsky. The state actually lost 1.135 billion, or about 2.9 percent, over the previous fiscal year. And anytime you lose money in the general funds from a previous fiscal year, that means that things are very bad. The last time that that's happened were the two prior recessions. Now, this is guided in large part by the three main sources of revenue that make up the bulk of this state's general revenue funds, and that is the personal income tax, the corporate income tax, and sales taxes, each of which fell last fiscal year compared with the year prior. Income taxes fell by just over 4%. Now, Mashinsky says that's not really as bad as it could have been, and that's largely because of that $600 bonus that the federal government is giving throughout this month. Because yes, unemployment is taxed. I guess the bad news is, unless there's legislative action at the federal level to continue that, that will abruptly end at the end of July. So some of that softening will dissipate then as we head into August, September, October. Um, and so that's of course a concern. As for corporate income taxes, they slid by 14%. Sales taxes, they went down, but year to year by only about 2%. And for June, we actually saw sales tax only falling about 10.5%, which
which really is pretty good. In fact, sales tax, when we look at our official forecast we released in, uh, in early May, we were able to beat our sales tax estimate by approximately 200 million. So things, things did do better uh, from the sales tax side of life than what we had thought. Now, other smaller sources of revenue, they don't make up as big a dent in the state budget, but they add up. And they also may tell us something about how people behave during the stay-at-home orders. For example, fewer people played the lottery. Receipts dove 14%. Revenue from casinos fell further still by about 27%, which makes sense because they were closed from mid-March through the beginning of this month. At one spot that receipts increased, booze. Uh, say liquor taxes. Well, we've actually did a little bit better for liquor taxes this year. Was that because people were shut in drinking more? Well, I don't know. Mashinsky says liquor receipts rise naturally, but this 3% minor uptick is more than is typical. I also got new figures from the state tollway authority, but with fewer people staying home, there are of course fewer folks on the roads and then fewer people to pay tolls. Year to date, the tollway says transactions are down 27.6% from projections. In April, passenger tollway transactions were at only 45% of what the agency had anticipated for that month. But Tommy tells me traffic is slowly coming back. So good for the budget, bad for those of us who are on the roads. The tollway, by the way, is taking a much gentler touch when it comes to tolls that have gone unpaid. And you'll be able to find out more about that on our website. Now, Mushinsky is going to be keeping an eye on all of these numbers. We're not out of the woods, I guess, would be the, would be the, the argument. And neither is the state's budget. One thing that is throwing off the numbers on personal income tax receipts, that coronavirus-inspired extension on the tax filing deadline. So here's your reminder, that new deadline, July 15th, a week from Wednesday. Ferris, back to you. All right, Amanda, thank you as always. And we're back with new data on Chicago flooding right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the City Club of Chicago. Smart people may disagree about what makes a great city, but part of what makes Chicago great is that we don't have to agree. To run a city like ours, a lot of issues come up. The City Club of Chicago is a place to debate those issues and hear from the men and women who shape the policies, lead the industries, and tell the stories that define our city. For the free and open exchange of ideas, the City Club of Chicago. Chicago saw record amounts of rainfall for the third May in a row, and with the rain came the return of flooded streets, parks, and basements across the region. A new analysis by the Brooklyn nonprofit First Street Foundation says that 13% of properties in Chicago are highly vulnerable to flooding, and that number is only projected to rise. This despite hundreds of millions spent in the last several years on the Deep Tunnels Project. And joining us to talk about First Street Foundation's analysis is Executive Director Matthew Eby. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So your modeling basically indicates that 150,000 properties here in Cook County are at risk, high risk of flooding. How severe is that risk? So when you look at that risk, you have to take it in context of an annual likelihood. So when we talk about any flood risk, that means that a property falls within the one in 500 risk. And then when you actually graduate to the more likely but less severe events, so a 1% or a 10% or a 20% risk, the number of impacted properties go down, but the likelihood of those flooding events uh, goes up. So when you talk about any flood risk, that's when you're talking about 150,000 properties, or if you're talking about severe flood risk or that 1% special flood hazard area as, as FEMA defines it, that's when you're in the more of the, the 77,000 properties within the city. So, so FEMA had defined it a different way. They'd come up with 77,000 properties that were at risk. You came up with 150,000 properties. I, is that why the disparity between the two numbers? Actually, it's a little different than that. If you look at uh, FEMA properties that are identified as, as being in that special flood hazard area for the city, there's only 1,500 properties that fall within that definition. And what our model shows is that that's more like 77,000 properties. 
So a significant increase. So you're talking about 0.3% of properties is what FEMA has identified versus our model says around 13% of properties in the city have that level of risk. And, and, and the metric you're using here, one of the metrics is uh, risk of a 100 year flood or a 1% risk factor. Uh, explain what that means. Yeah, absolutely. So when, when people think of flood risk, they always think on an annualized basis or a 1% uh, as, it, as it's called, which means in, in their minds, they could think that happens once every 100 years. But actually, it, it doesn't work like that. It has the likelihood each year of happening 1%. So if you have a home for 30 years, say, so the likelihood of a mortgage, uh, kind of the bread and butter product in the US for mortgages, uh, you have that 1% risk every year. So it's 1% this year, 1% next year, 1% next year. And what that means is risk accumulates over time. So it's like having a giant roulette wheel with 100 numbers on it. And every year you're spinning that wheel and you're hoping that it doesn't land on your on your number. But if you do that for 30 years or 30 spins, the likelihood of that happening is actually 26% or one, one in four. So it's a it's a very likely over time to happen those severe events, and that's why it's kind of defined by FEMA as the special flood hazard area. And certainly there have been more severe uh, weather events, uh, especially in Chicago in the last several years. We just saw the map. I wonder if we can look at that again, showing the flood risk. I mean, seems to be located along Chicago's waterways, the Chicago River, but there's also areas not along rivers like uh, Wicker Park, Englewood that that showed high risk. What accounts for that? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great observation. So in our model, we look at a few different types of flooding. So we look at uh, fluvial flooding, which is riverine flooding. We look at hurricane storm surge. And those two things, you would be concentrated around the ocean or concentrated around lakes and rivers. But we also map something called pluvial flooding. And pluvial flooding is precipitation events. So those uh, intensity, duration, and frequency of precipitation events has been going up. Uh, over time. So that's what you see on those those pockets inland are those lower elevation areas where there's a whole bunch of rain that comes down on this impervious surface because it's a city and the water can't actually absorb into the ground. So then it runs to the lowest point. And if an overwhelmed uh, sewer system and where the water should be actually flowing into can't handle that volume of water, that's when you see the water and the, the depths start to pile up and why those pockets exist because there's actual high risk of flooding in the city in those areas. Certainly we've seen those pockets in Chicago in recent years. Is there any data that shows um, how uh, this affects low income residents or uh, residents of color given um, you know the environmental situation in Chicago tends to impact those communities more? Yeah, no, it's a great question and one that's come up a lot since we released the data. We actually have a, a group called the Flood Lab that's working with us. It's about a uh, hundred economists and sociologists uh, from around the country that are looking at secondary impacts based on this flood risk data. And they're looking into that exact question. And they actually have found that that, that is the case in certain areas around the country. And they're doing a more formal analysis that'll come out that's really looking into the discrepancies there and why in each geographic location that may be to so have the full understanding of, of kind of the history that led up to that and then why it may still exist today or into the future. You know, we've talked a lot about higher lake levels on this show and the climate reasons for that. Is there indication that climate change is causing more properties to be at severe risk for flooding? Yeah, absolutely. So what our model actually does is looks at current risk but it doesn't just stop there. It uses the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Changes, the, the IPCC as it's called, the RCP curve. So uh, the representative concentration pathway, which essentially means where do we expect emissions to go in the near term, that next 30 years? And then how is that going to change the factors of risk uh, around flooding? And then within that, what we're able to model is by year, how is that risk changing? And then give a good picture of flood risk to the individual. So. If you go to floodfactor.com and you type in your address or you type in Chicago, you can not only see the risk today, but how it's changing into the future based on those changes. And specifically for the city, that means that not only are 77,000 properties at risk today in that 1% flood zone or greater, but by 2050, that actually changes to 84,000 properties that have that same level of risk. So ones that don't have that risk today or a lower level of risk, but actually graduate into that risk category over that 30 year period. All right, Matthew Eby, thank you so much for joining us. And we have more on your study on our website, wttw.com news. Thank you so much.
A local museum was born out of a protest movement. When Nazis sought to march in Skokie in 1978, they did not get their wish. Residents resisted and six years later opened a storefront museum whose mission remains to take a stand against bias. We recently visited the Illinois Holocaust Museum for a virtual tour and learned a few things about what inspires them and who they inspire. Here's arts producer Mark Vitale with another look. Their home since 2009, designed by the architect Stanley Tigerman, is a symbol of darkness and light. Inside, the galleries lead from desperation to inspiration. But it's quiet as the museum looks forward to one day reopening to visitors, school groups, and even police recruits. Our staff have made a very smooth transition to working remotely, and we've even figured out how to transition teacher trainings and our law enforcement trainings of police recruits and newly promoted sergeants, lieutenants, and captains. Each year, hundreds of police cadets and officer candidates visit as part of their ethics training. We have, uh, for about a decade now, worked with all recruits to Chicago Police Department as part of their extensive onboarding and training. They spend a day at our museum thinking about anti-bias, balancing the rights of individuals with the needs of our democracy, and uh, case studies and more. They see artwork, a boxcar built in Germany in the early 20th century of the type that transported people to death camps and interactive holograms of Holocaust survivors. And I tell them, a bully must be stopped. The museum is about more than history. Social justice is their mission. A short version is remember the past, transform the future. And, and we use the history and lessons of the Holocaust as a jumping off point to make connections to our world today, inspiring and enabling our visitors and everybody to become upstanders as opposed to bystanders. The museum emerged after neo-Nazis threatened to march in a Jewish community with many Holocaust survivors. They were confronted with this hatred and so they raised their voices, they raised resources and they, they fought back realizing that education is the best antidote to hatred and bigotry. You've been fighting for the right to speak out freely as you are on this program, right? I have been. But you would deny that right to others, wouldn't you? A few years earlier, John Calloway and Joel Weissman hosted a political forum at WTTW that included the white power candidate who later tried to lead the march in Skokie. That's why we are militant whites. That's why we use the swastika to gain attention and to arouse our people to fight back. And we are winning and we are doing this. How, how are you winning? What uh, well, proof do you have of winning? Well, have you won any offices? Have you, have you killed any blacks or Jews? I mean, what are, you, what, what are, the, what are the facts? With reports of anti-Semitism and hate crimes on the rise, the museum and its partners are paying attention. We are all looking at that on the heightened incidents of calling out groups as others. And during this pandemic, as we know, it's been a, a lot of attention on Asian groups and Jewish groups as well, who have had some unwanted issues of discrimination in that regard. It's all about inspiring our youth to engage civically and stand up for themselves and others. That really is our mission, recognizing the stake we all have to make our world a better place. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. The Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center just announced their reopening next Wednesday, July 15th, and opening day will be free. And up next, a local children's book is back in the spotlight. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash daily briefing and sign up. There's renewed interest in a children's book written and illustrated by a couple of Chicagoans. The Skin You Live In was published in 2005 by the Chicago Children's Museum. And joining us now are the author Michael Tyler and the illustrator David Lee Sisko. Welcome both of you to Chicago Tonight. Thank you for having me. So Michael, The Skin You Live In published first in 2005. What inspired you originally to write it? I wrote it because my eldest son, who is now 31, when he was five years old, he came home from school one day, uh, and he, had, he was very emotionally upset because he had endured his first name-calling incident. And so there I was trying to talk to a five-year-old about what racism and discrimination was about. And uh, 
as, to, as we understand, we adults have an extremely difficult time having a conversation about that. So you can only imagine how difficult it is for an adult to try to have that conversation with a five-year-old. So I did what most parents do. I copped out and I said, I'm going to go find a book, a children's book, and I'll read it to you. And I thought that would be a kickstart of a conversation. And I spent two weeks and I read 347 books and I had to find a single one that I wanted to read to my child about this issue. So I was left to write it. And that's how it all came to be. And there's lots of rhymes in there, you know, talking about uh, positive images of, uh, of black and, and white uh, um, kids. And uh, David Lee Zisco, you provide the illustrations. How did you get involved? Uh, I had done one of the cows, remember Cows on Parade many, sure. many years ago? And uh, Michael had seen a cow that I did that celebrated diversity. And an art director that I knew proposed me for the project. And Michael said, I already have somebody in mind. And it turns out it was me all along. There you go. And, and this team came together. And we heard, as we look at some images from the book, um, this was a particular favorite of Michelle Obama, of Serena Williams. Uh, Michael Tyler, what, what did you make of that response to the book? I was very happy about it. Uh, it was very validating because the effort to get this book to publication required me to endure 10 years and 147 rejections by traditional publishing houses to get it to publication. I finally took it to the Chicago Children's Museum and the book was very successful right off the bat. Its first year in publication, it received awards and they got a lot of recognition. So for have people of that magnitude um, welcome it into their own home, read it to their own children, it was very validating. And David Lee Sisko, there is renewed interest in it right now, as we mentioned at the top. What do you make of the role this book plays in the current cultural moment that we're in? Uh, somehow the book has always found its, its audience since it started from hospitals to schools to um, art centers and programs about the book. And um, with what's going on now, the, the book has been a really gentle way to talk about important issues. And Michael, what about you? Is this what you would hope for, especially in a time like this, that this book would be a catalyst to discuss these things, especially among families and children? Absolutely, because when I wrote the book in consideration of what I wanted to instruct in my son, and after having read so many books, one thing that I noticed that was an error in thinking as far as I was concerned is that all those other books promoted tolerance, which is basically a policy of civil segregation. It says that we never have to really embrace one another's humanity. We just have to endure one another's presence. And I don't think that that is a moral virtue that's ever going to overcome this. So I wrote The Skin You Live In to promote acceptance. And I think that in this moment right now, where we've seen the likes of division, the like, uh, and uh, on a magnitude and scale we haven't seen since 1968, perhaps, that this book can emerge as a tool for educators, for parents, to try to give that lesson to their children about acceptance. And it's also the kind of book that when adults read it, it gives them a little internal audit themselves. And so that's what I'm hoping it'll do in a moment. And that is indeed happening. You have school districts that are adopting this book as part of their curriculum in elementary school. And Michael, is, is there a favorite passage of yours, a favorite rhyme uh, that really gets at uh, the point you're trying to make in this book? I would say there are favorite sections, but not necessarily rhymes. One is we always speak in terms of black and white, and those are political terms. And I wanted to give parents and adults a different color model for children to understand what color means, much more benign model. So that section of the book I'm very happy about. But I would say the section I'm most proud of is a section that actually deconstructs the mythology we assign to skin, the section that talks about what it is and what it isn't, because that's the main point of it. And I want to get back to that in a second. David, you know, Chicagoans might be unaware that they, they are involved and immersed in your artwork every day because it's all over the CTA. Um, it's a lot of sunny artwork. Are, are you naturally an optimistic, sunny person, or is there some darkness uh, in your art, too? Uh, I, I, it may be a, well, I believe we need to see sunny, happy images, especially right now. And uh, my, as I'm finding my voice as an artist, often it comes from dealing with darker issues, but uh, this is a children's book. <laughs> and it, it needs to be 
delightful and meaningful. And so when I was illustrating the book, I would look at each page and figure out what is the thought behind what the message is. And so I tried to come up with images that kids could relate to. So there's an image of two boys having an ice cream sundae. There's an image of a basketball game. There's an image of a child playing a violin. Um, there's this wonderful image of uh, children going to a place like the Peggy Notabart Nature Museum. So I thought about Chicago and places kids would go. And I know that places like the Nature Museum, that's become a popular thing to go to live butterflies and see how marvelous they are. And so I just kept thinking, what are things that kids love? And I would try to put that into, the, into what I was drawing. Thank you, Michael Tyler and David Lee Sisko, for joining us. Again, the book is called The Skin You Live In. And we're back with more Chicago Tonight right after this. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by ComEd, powering lives. We have a tremendous source of untapped efficient energy right here in our school. Let her rip, Jenny. I kind of love this idea. <laughs> The ComEd Energy Efficiency Program has real ideas for making schools energy efficient. Pedal faster! Chicago's piping plover chicks need new names. Last summer, a pair of endangered piping plover birds created quite a stir when they showed up at Montrose Beach. This year, they are back again, and three baby chicks hatched just a few weeks ago. Here to spread her wings and fill us in on the details is WTTW News reporter Patty Wetley. Hey, Patty. Hi, Paris. Okay, so remind us what happened last year and all the fanfare around the piping plovers at Montrose Beach. Yeah, the plovers are um, a coastal bird and they hadn't been seen, a breeding pair hadn't been seen in Cook County since 1955. So when a pair turned up last summer on Montrose Beach, um, conservationists, nature lovers, but especially birders were so incredibly excited because they're really, the population had gotten down to about 20 breeding pairs in the Great Lakes. Um, so seeing this bird kind of recover or revival was really exciting. And did bird experts expect that they would return this year? I think you're kind of not sure if they would return. I don't know if anybody was 100% sure. I think people were hopeful that maybe they'd establish that this was going to be their nesting spot. But um, when they came back this spring, people were, again, incredibly excited um, and working really hard to protect the pair so that they could have a calm breeding environment and that their nest would be undisturbed as well. And I think that video we saw was the birds doing the mating dance. So fill us in, how do people submit names for these three baby chicks? Yeah, we've posted the links online in our story. There's submission forms in English and in Spanish. People can enter um, as many as three names and it should have some sort of link to Chicago history, culture, diversity. I mean, I said maybe Sandy, I've seen some people say Cora or Corey because of coronavirus, um, or Peter Piping Plover was another one <laughs> that I saw. So we'll see what they end up with. So no one submitted the name Mambi, you know, the Mambi on the Beach Festival last year. <laughs> no Mambi, no Mambi. No Mambi, okay, all right. You can read more about Monty Rose and their Piping Plover family on our website. That's WTTW.com slash news. At WTDW, we feel pretty lucky to be able to make the shows we do, including the many documentary productions looking back at Chicago's history. We also feel pretty lucky to have a unique resource for old footage of Chicago for those shows, a film archive that was created and now preserved by a family of rail transit workers and self-taught film hobbyists. Jay Shevsky has that story. If you've ever marveled at archive footage of old Chicago in a WTTW documentary, chances are good it came from this North Suburban basement. This is where former CTA Chief Rail Equipment Engineer Walt Keevil has spent long hours with a singular focus, preserving and digitizing the films his uncle Charles Keevil made of Chicago's boom years. This is the Charlie Keevil film archive. These are his vacation films, as well as 
1933-34 World's Fair films. Down here he has also family and vacation films. This is a reel of negative film that he shot for the South Shore dated 1927. This is the, the original 1927 negative, which is still in pretty decent shape. Most of it is not here. It's in a storage facility where I can keep it safe and more or less climate controlled. Walt Kievel says his uncle began making movies around 1915. He wasn't a cinematographer. He was a photographer who took movies. He had a good eye for it, but he was not a professional at it. Charlie Kievel was an equipment engineer for Rapid Transit, a predecessor of the CTA. Walt Kievel says that when Charlie began making films, it was mostly films of his family. But his hobby took on a professional bent when he joined the South Shore Line in 1925. He took his movie camera with him down to Michigan City, and he was taking pictures of various things. And so they sort of said, oh, you know how to take movies. And so by default, he became sort of the photographer of choice down there for the South Shore. Charlie Kievel's skill was put to use making employee training films like this one, titled Black Rail. It was an instruction film on how to properly stop a streetcar under the worst rail conditions, which was known as Black Rail, which is when you had a light uh, rain or condensation on the head of the rail that mixed with the dirt and the grease and made it as slick as pew, ice. He also made tourist films for the rapid transit lines, highlighting Chicago's attraction. The Chicago film for the South Shore was, of course, filmed for them so that they would use that in the cities along the railroad to advertise coming to Chicago, ride the South Shore, come to Chicago, see all these things. Charlie Keevil retired from the CTA in 1965, about a decade before his nephew Walt started down a similar career path with the CTA. Walt says that while Charlie had a plan for preserving his films, it didn't work out. And when Charlie passed away in 1988, Walt took the collection over himself. Since then, Walt Kievel has painstakingly preserved and later digitized his uncle's films. In the 1990s, WTTW asked viewers to send in home movies for a production of Remembering Chicago. And Walt Kievel sent in a clip of a home movie shot not by his uncle, but his father, who was also a film hobbyist. Two boys with the hula hoops, myself and my brother. That clip marked the beginning of a new life for the Kievel films. Not long after, Walt Kievel struck an agreement with WTTW, allowing us to use his uncle's films in documentary productions. WTTW producer Eddie Griffin, who has included Kievel footage in a number of productions, says that the Kievel archive gives the shows a richness unmatched by other archive sources. One of the reels that we have, I think, is from 1927. A shot of the Chicago Art Institute. Out in front, you've got the lions, you've got people passing by, and he just lets it, he just rolls on it for a little bit of time. So now, if you want to talk about the Art Institute, you've got it. If you want to talk about people, dress, you know, period piece, you know, kind of looking stuff, you've got that. He brought a real filmmaker's eye um, to the way that he shot B-roll. Now, who knows what he thought that that was ever going to be used for, but just the way he preserved the city, no one else in Chicago can show what he shot. And preserving and sharing that history is why Walt Kievel says he's determined to see his uncle's films live on. It's an important part of history that will otherwise disappear. What they're showing is gone in most cases. And to me, that's important to be able to see what was there, just to make sure that the history hasn't been lost. That's what I'm trying to do. For Chicago Tonight, this is Jay Shefsky. You can watch a clip of one of Charlie Keeble's tourist films from the 1930s on our website. And before we go, some viewer feedback. Mayor Lightfoot's call for Chicagoans returning from visits to COVID-19 hotspots drew some strong reaction on both sides. What? 
Number one, how will these visitors be identified? Number two, how will these visitors be tracked? You heard Dr. Arwady earlier, they won't be tracked. Think the idea is to put into place and rely on people's natural inclination to try to do the right thing. At the end of the day, most people don't want to be the source of spreading the virus to their loved ones. And her story about many colleges and universities dropping requirements for the ACT and SAT this year, and some dropping it for good, drew these responses. This will pave the way for degree mills and worthless degrees. Or maybe an end to the children of the privileged getting higher scores because their parents can afford the tutoring to ace the test. There will certainly be admission requirements. They obviously will look at grades, extracurricular, volunteer, and even essay submissions. They're pushing students through the entire educational system. Why not college? Or why not college? I think that's how they meant to write that. As always, we appreciate hearing from you. Join the discussion on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our website, wttw.com news. And that is our show for this Monday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. We check in on how the economy is doing as the nation slowly reopens. And what options are there for kids during the summer pandemic? And now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and safe and good evening. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that is proud of its partners named Illinois Leading Lawyers by the Law Bulletin Publishing Company of Chicago.